All right, so I want to welcome you to this interview with uh, filmmaker Kevin Pear. My name is Rob Yannis. I'm one of the co-founders of System Change Alliance, and I'm very pleased to have uh, Kevin here. Kevin Pear has been a filmmaker for the past 35 years. He has worked for, as a filmmaker for the National Geographic Television, the U.S. National Park Service, and also as a freelance documentary filmmaker. His documentary films have been seen by millions of people around the world, and he has received over 40 national and international film festival awards, including two Emmy nominations. Currently, he is engaged in developing a project called the Center for Conscious Cinema. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be so, here. Um, so I, I know that you've been working as a filmmaker for the past 35 plus years. Now, looking back into your past, was there a pivotal moment in your early life that inspired you to become a filmmaker? Yes, it was. Uh, I know the very moment. Um, I was a senior or a junior in college um, studying forestry and wildlife. I thought I wanted to be a wildlife biologist and be kind of a, um, a photographer on the side. And I was also a, a, a cartoonist at the time. So uh, I thought I could come up with a kind of a career plan, you know, around that. But I hadn't even contemplated film. And I, um, uh, a, a remarkable film called The Black Stallion, directed by Carol Ballard, was, was playing at the theater in town. And it was an autumn night and it was raining. And, uh, and I went in and I watched that film and I had never seen anything like it in my life. Uh, and it, 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 it captured kind of the, the, the soul of, of the wild spirit in a way that I'd never seen uh, before. And I was, uh, so I walked out of the theater standing in the rain and going, my God, this is what I want to do with my life. I want to make films. And even then I thought it would be documentary rather than, rather than feature films. Um, so that was it. And it was also uh, being a photographer. Um, I had entered some of my work in a campus uh, exhibition and won some of the top prizes and the person who bought a couple of the photographs in that exhibit was a professor of um, psychoneurobiology and um, we became friends and he was a, a zen practitioner and a Jungian and you know he was a brilliant man and um, he, all, he was the one who actually suggested documentary films he says well you like to write and you like photography and you love telling stories and and you want to make a difference in the world why don't you make films you don't you don't have to just try to do one of them why don't you make films and so that was a big aha moment that uh that could be a, a viable path for me and so that was mm -hmm. the that was the beginning i never uh, i took a couple of classes that were available in college but there wasn't a film department or anything so essentially i'm i'm self-taught but i managed to get an intern position with the National Park Service uh, right after graduating. And, um, and then things just took off very, very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you work for the National Park Service uh, creating documentary films, is that right? Yes. Yeah, I made uh, three films for them and they were the, uh, the visitor center films. So, you know, you drive into the National Park and if you go to the visitor center and most of them will have a little amphitheater uh, and, uh, and there'll be some kind of an orientation film. And with all three of those films, um, particularly the last uh, two films that I did, you know, I tried to make them very, um, very timeless in a way, because the tendency tended to be to make films that showed sort of park activities and various things like that. And, and they would be dated after about three years, you know, and, and it was kind of, silly to go into a national park and to watch a film and with hairstyles and clothing styles and talking styles and even filmmaking styles from you know a long time ago really so um that was kind of the beginning of me wanting to look at storytelling from a deeper uh perspective and because of that the three three films that i made everglades national park uh denali national park and preserve in alaska and uh, Crater Lake National Park in, in Oregon, 
all three of those films were visitor center films for um, over 20 years in those parks. Um, so they got their money's worth, you know, because they agreed to really talk about the timeless aspects of, of uh, wilderness and, and those particular places. Um, so yeah, that was, it was, and it was such a great, great honor. I mean, it was extraordinary to, you know, to be in those national parks and to know that, that the love of place, if I could train, if I could translate it successfully, you know, would um, ultimately, you know, have a benefit for those parks because people want to protect what they love. And if I could help to elicit love or, or even amplify the love that they already brought to those parks, then um, they would, you know, very likely be involved in, in helping to prevent, you know, threats from happening to those parks. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when I was living in Oregon, as a matter of fact, I watched the Crater Lake film that you did. And I was so struck uh, in the beginning of the film, you know, because you had brought in this beautiful cosmology of the natives living in that area and, and sort of the mythical history of the film and, and the cultural history. And that to me was so powerful. Uh, maybe you can share a little bit about that, uh, your thinking behind that, and also maybe a little bit about Crater Lake itself, because it's such a magical place. Mm, boy, it sure is. That, and that was my introduction to Oregon in 1983, uh, was, um, mm -hmm. was getting the assignment to film a Crater Lake. Um, and I arrived uh, like February 6th, something like that, and there were 16 feet of snow on the ground at Crater Lake, no exaggeration. There were 16 feet of snow on the ground when I arrived in February. And when I kind of uh, finished the winter filming in April, there was 22 feet of snow on the ground. So it was really, um, it was really, it was like a parallel universe there, you know, because it is so powerful, it's so vast, it's so mysterious. It definitely carries a very, very strong energy. And, you know, the first thing that I did, I, I knew that the park uh, service people at Crater Lake National Park had this idea for a film about showing boat rides and, you know, the various touristy things that you could do and something about the geology of how the lake formed. Um, but the first thing that I did was I went out and uh, did a little snowshoeing, uh, which was pretty hilarious because it was more falling uh, than snowshoeing. Um, but went to the rim and looked out over that rim and I, I opened, and I don't want this to sound real woo woo, but it just is what it is. I just opened to the spirit of place. You know, I, I was willing to acknowledge that, that there are forces that are seen and unseen. And I've felt the spirit of place, you know, in many places that I've been. And so I essentially said, spirits of place, what do you want of me? What story do you want me to tell? What is going to be of benefit to this place and to your protection of this place? And the idea immediately came, tell, tell the native story. Tell the story uh, of, the, of the creation of this lake, you know, honor the spirits of place. And, and so that's what I did. And, and I was, um, so I did a lot of research uh, in the local library. This is before the internet. Um, and, um, and in the library at the park service, they had some historical documents, uh, from the early, um, uh, whites who had been in the area and what their impressions were and their early conversations with some of the, uh, Klamath peoples who lived in the area. Uh, and mostly they were very tight lipped, you know, they're because times were very, very bad for them and they're not going to just tell their secrets and their stories, but they found somebody who they could trust. And that's what got written down. And it was a, there was a story of a great battle between the spirit of the above world and the spirit of the below world. And the below world being um, exemplified by this titanic uh, volcanic eruption that happened over a period of time, but was really cataclysmic. Blew off the upper 5,000 feet of the mountain the rest of it kind of collapsed in on itself. And then there was another volcano that came out in the middle and it sealed the bottom and then it filled with 2000 feet of water. 
Um, but to them, it was this great battle between, uh, between the spirit of light and the spirit of darkness. And, um, and it paralleled the ge what we would call the geological story. So, you know, we're bringing uh, uh, technological, you, you know, uh, ration, so called rational culture is bringing another kind of story. And the story was this geological story. And, um, but they paralleled each other quite a bit. And so the film became kind of this mixture of, of uh, both, but predominantly the, the native story. And to my pleasant surprise, when I presented that idea to the Park Service, uh, expecting fully to kind of get blown out of the water and, and fired <laughs> because it was so different than what they had suggested. And there was a long silence and, you know, some of them had their Smokey the Bear hat on and, you know, the very, and finally the, the uh, chief of interpretation who's kind of in charge of the films and everything said, sounds good. And so to their great credit, because they were very, you know, they're a very traditional kind of park. Uh, uh, and um, so I think to, to their credit, they decided to do something kind of different, you know, hadn't been done before, hadn't been done with other park service films before. So, you know, it was, um, there was a story that I really deeply internalized and I found that, um, you know, when I, when I internalized that feeling of place and felt in, in, in cooperation and partnership with, with the place itself. And, and if you, I don't mean to overuse the term spirits of place, but um, being receptive to whatever, you know, to the energy that is there to the, there is a form of guidance. And, and then that guidance gets translated into very nuts and bolts kinds of activity of actually doing the filming. Uh, so the, the kind of work that I do that I gravitate towards and uh, when I'm teaching filmmaking and everything, it's about bringing all of yourself to the process. You know, so you, you, bring, you bring the intellect and there's, and there's plenty to do for the intellect when you're making a film, but you also bring your heart and then you also bring an openness to the to the unseen world uh, and to intuition and to what you call synchronicity and it's like bring it all you know it's like bring all of yourself and I found that filmmaking became this great way for me to do that you know to to have uh, uh, great demands put on me and I'm not even talking about fundraising or that whole world I'm just talking about being motivated by love uh, and, and a very uh, embodied kind of love and being a student to that love. And there isn't any film that I've ever done where I felt equal to the task, you know, where I felt where I went in and just went, oh, this is a piece of cake. You know, it's because I'm always open to the mystery and, and to how uh, things can evolve uh, during a project. Um, and that doesn't mean that I don't go in with definite goals and then, you know, hopefully fulfill those goals with the film. It just means that I'm open intuitively, intellectually, emotionally. Um, and so it becomes a very complete experience as a filmmaker. And I think it helps to make better films as a, as a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's <laughs> exactly what I was feeling when I was watching the film. That combination of, as you were saying, between the, the science and the geology and, and the history of it from a, a so-called so Western perspective of what happened there. Because as you said, this was a huge explosion that happened, I think, about 7,000 years ago or so. And, and the ashes covered you know, many different states uh, in the United States. And, and then the native story behind it. And that to me was so compelling and so powerful and, 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 and really inspiring. So after working for the National Park Service, uh, did you then move on to doing other projects? Is that when you, when you started working for uh, National Geographic? It was when I was editing the Crater Lake film, I was um, the uh, filmmaking headquarters for the National Park Service is in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. 
And uh, Harpers Ferry is a very historic uh, Civil War town. And it's where the Shenandoah and the Potomac Rivers come together. And during the Carter administration, there was a good amount of, of uh, funding available for the Park Service. And there was a series of people who, um, who said, who were real visionaries and said, let's get the artists and the writers and the architects and the designers and all these people, let's get them out of Washington, DC, get them away from the bureaucrats and put them in an inspiring location where they can do their best work. And so they built this beautiful modernistic uh, building that overlooked the, the Shenandoah River. And, um, uh, and that's where all these things were, were made out of. So I uh, went back and edited the film in, uh, in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And then, and there, and then there's another part to that question. I'm sorry, and I and I spaced yeah, it out. <laughs> no, yeah, the, the connection between that and National Geographic is that when oh, right, when you right. yeah. So during that time, um, I got invited to um, uh, to give some talks at a few private schools in the Washington D.C. area, and it turns out that one of them was a real exclusive school that a lot of you know, the movers and shakers of Washington, D.C., uh, where they lived um, and where their kids went to school. Um, and so showed, showed the film there, showed it elsewhere. And unbeknownst to me, um, uh, there were a number of people, like a couple of teachers and a parent who saw the film uh, and uh, that I had done on Denali National Park and Preserve. That was the second film I did for uh, the National Park Service. Everglades National Park was first, and then Denali National Park and Preserve, which is a 30 minute film about the Alaskan wilderness. Um, and so I showed that film and um, unbeknownst to me, some people contacted the president of National Geographic who they knew personally and said, hey, there's this young kid, I was in my mid twenties and um, you, know, you should talk to him. You should get him in here and have him work for you. So I got an invitation in the mail and I almost threw it out, didn't open it because I thought it was, I already had a subscription to National Geographic and I thought, oh, right, this is another letter getting me to buy more maps or something. And uh, it even said office of the president, you know, and, it, and but a lot of them did, you know, the marketing emails and or, uh, emails, nope, before email. So, um, uh, so I looked and they said, Mr. Pierre, we've heard about you and we'd appreciate if you'd come in and have a talk. Um, and so, uh, long story short, um, I met with them, showed them the film, um, and uh, like I said, I was about 25 years old at the time, and, and they said, okay, we got this crazy idea for something called National Geographic Explorer, and it's going to be a 24-hour cable channel thing, and, and as soon as we get the money, uh, we want to hire you, and, but we're still trying to convince the board of directors to do this venture. So about two years later, uh, and after completing the Crater Lake film and doing some other, you know, some freelance work and everything, um, they gave me a call and said, can you be in, in Tokyo in four days? And I was actually in Alaska writing a script uh, for a film about glaciers. And I said, can you give me a week? And so seven days later, I was on my first assignment in Japan. Hmm. Wow. If, I, if I can, I just want to mention a synchronicity here, because when I was editing the Crater Lake film, there was an image that I had cut out of National Geographic, one of those trifold things. You know, it's the first time that I've ever cut anything out of a National Geographic, which seemed like sacrilege. But it was an image of uh, these uh, fish, a school of fish that was poised over lava with a wave crashing over it. But it looked like spaceships hovering over the atmosphere of a planet with this, with these gases coming in from above. It was extraordinary, haunting. And I used to just lay there when I was resting and look at that image and look at that image and just feel it and the mystery and the beauty and the power of it. And um, so the, when National Geographic called me and asked me to go to Japan, the assignment was actually for uh, uh, filming an underwater photographer who had taken that image that I had been looking at. And I ended up filming on a cliff from where that image was, was taken. So 
you just never know. So synchronicity does happen. So uh, when, when you were in, uh, in Alaska, um, and, you know, most people know that in Alaska, there are grizzly bears. They are huge. Um, they, they can be ferocious. Did you ever have any close encounters with grizzly bears when you were up there? Yeah, quite, yeah, quite a few, quite a few. I was really, really lucky. Um, you know, National Park, you're not supposed to carry a weapon. Um, and um, so I, I, I carried a, um, um, it was a smoke flare and it was like this wooden handle and you'd have to take, <clears throat> take the cap off and strike this thing. And then there'd be this intense orange smoke that would go on for a while, kind of a military grade one. And I had this fantasy that if I ever ran into a bad situation with a bear, I just go <laughs> and then smoke it out and run the other way. Um, but I had, um, <clears throat> I had many encounters with grizzlies because when you're in grizzly country, you sh to really be safe, you need to make a lot of noise because a lot of attacks happen um, when, uh, when a bear is surprised and it can be a lone bear or it could be a sow with cubs, a female bear, you know, mother bear with cubs. Uh, and oftentimes those attacks <clears throat> are not fatal, but you know, they can mess you up permanently. Um, mm -hmm. Those kind of attacks, usually they knock you down, they bite you a few times and sort of like going, how dare you surprise me like that? Slap, slap, mm -hmm. uh, and then leave you alone. <laughs> but you can also run into a bear who has just um, made a kill. And that is one time when it is usually a deadly encounter. Um, mm -hmm. And it happens yeah. every year and it happens with hunters. And in some areas where, um, you know, of course, outside of national parks, national park. they've, uh, the grizzlies have gotten to where when they hear a gunshot, they will head in the direction of the gunshot. And they know that they're likely to find an animal. Uh, and when they do, they, they try to take it. And if a hunter shows up, they'll sometimes kill the hunter. So very dangerous. Um, one of the most vivid uh, encounters was um, being in an area that was actually closed to the public, but was open to me. Um, the, the snow and the ice was still melting. It was very treacherous to try to uh, navigate around. And I was looking for a group of um, uh, doll sheep because um, it was the, it was the, birthing season for doll sheep for these beautiful sheep with the long uh curving horns and um so i found this group of sheep and there were these ewes uh who the female sheep who were like in this little group and they a couple of them were pregnant and you can just see the the they were just ready to give birth and the biologist and everything said you know any day any minute now and um so i thought okay i'm gonna i'm gonna film this because i know also that that's a very vulnerable time for those animals. And it's likely that a wolf or a grizzly or a wolverine or some kind of predator, predator would, um, uh, could show up. Um, so long, <clears throat> long story short, um, ended up finding a grizzly that um, we saw the grizzly, we saw the, these pregnant sheep, the grizzly ran up this gully uh, the sheep didn't see it until it was too late. It grabbed one of them, uh, killed it. And um, this was one of the most foolish things that I've ever done in my life. Um, I camped out on a ridge that was like the next spur ridge over. So there was only a gully that was separating us. It was maybe, you know, 200 yards away, 300, 250 yards away, something like that. Uh, woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of bones crunching and flesh tearing and and realized that I'd made a terrible mistake. If the wind direction changed, I was very likely dead. The next day, the grizzly, the wind direction did change and the grizzly hunted me and, um, and two young fellows from Switzerland who were helping me carry gear. And it hunted us the entire day. And um, we just barely escaped. Uh, and managed to make our way out before dark. But uh, that's just one of many 
mm -hmm. with with grizzlies. I feel very very fortunate, you know, to to be alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad that you managed to escape. Um, I want to change the, the topic a little bit. So, you also did some politically charged films, including a film about the atomic testing, <clears throat> the bombing. I understand there were 23 atomic bombs in the Bikini Atoll in between, I think, 1948 to 1956, somewhere in that uh, time frame. And you went there, I, I don't remember exactly when you went there, but you did a film about that, very sensitive issue, politically highly charged. And at the same time, you had to deal with the natives that had been, um, you know, uh, some probably <clears throat> fatally uh, affected by the atomic fallout. Uh, many people were sick and so on, and then they had to be relocated. So in a situation like that, how do you approach, uh, you know, it's a huge project, very sensitive. How do you approach if, uh, making a film about something like that? Well, of course, it depends on, um, on what kind of film you're trying to make. Um, and um, the... Um, there had been, um, yeah, basically, Shortly after World War II, you know, the U.S. wanted to um, to you know get out ahead and to remain ahead of the nuclear what was the beginning of the nuclear arms race, and they looked for a place uh, in the Pacific that was under U.S. control that was as remote as possible, uh, and they chose uh, the Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. Uh, they promised under a U.N trusteeship agreement to uh, not harm their islands and to give their islands back when they were done. Um, but they were basically forced out, not exactly a gunpoint, but um, that was the implication, you know, and pressured them and pressured them to, and they moved them to another atoll, but they miscalculated how much um, food the Bikinians would need. And there was a misplaced decimal point that um, made all the difference. And so they, they, uh, they went to this atoll and, um, and then they were starving within about a year. Um, and the government kind of went, oops, okay, well, we'll take you down to this island called Kili. And Kili was uh, in the middle of the ocean, no atoll, no protective ring, you know, a coral around it, no beautiful calm lagoon for fishing. It was just wild ocean, shark infested waters. Um, so that was where they were trying to live. They were completely dependent on USDA, you know, food, canned food, um, because they couldn't really fish. Uh, and um, it was a terrible situation. Um, but they, they did manage to find a very savvy lawyer and this was his first case. He was just out of law school, was starting work, um, was kind of given this assignment and, the, and the, uh, the law firm, I think, had no idea how big this thing was going to get. And he really rose to the occasion and he managed to get millions of dollars of restitution for them. But what the islanders really wanted was to return to their atoll and for the US to clean it up. So there was a lot of anger, there was a lot of mistrust, um, you know, in a way that most, a lot of people in the government were trying to do the right thing, some of them weren't. Um, so it was very charged. And when I, um, the challenge was, how do you make a film about this and what, and National Geographic was a little bit nervous because they'd never done a, a film that had a political charge to it before. Um, Basically, you know, I went over there, I filmed for several weeks and uh, interviewed Bikinians, et cetera. And uh, that in itself was very challenging because they had very, very strong preconceived ideas about um, what the film needed to be. And it was based on talking points that they had successfully used with the media in the past. So I'd watched every film or every news clip or anything, you know, that had been done on the Bikinians before, just as part of my research beforehand. And what I noticed when I started interviewing some of the Bikinians, and there were only certain people I was allowed to talk to, that they were saying the same thing that they had in these other films or, the, or these news clips. 
And so I wanted to go deeper. I wanted to go deeper into the into the suffering. I wanted to, I ultimately wanted because they needed more money. And they they wanted the government to write a blank check to clean up their islands as they had promised. Uh, or actually they had promised that they weren't going to harm the islands. Um, so they said, look, this is your problem. This is what you owe us. Um, and you know, if it takes $50 million to do it, then that's what you've got to do. Well, they weren't, the, the government wasn't there yet in, in providing that much money. Um, and so the Bikinians were, were angry about it. And I wanted this film to be able to convince members of Congress and the public and everything else to, to pay for the total remediation of, of their island so they can get rid of the radiation and return and live there safely. Um, so one of the challenges was how do I get more depth from the Bikinians themselves? And I found that it was really challenging because they were, they had a formula and they wanted to stick to the formula. And I kept saying, no, that's not, that's not going to cut it. You know, the, the people that are going to see this film have probably seen these other films. So I need to go deeper. I actually need to go deeper into your suffering. Um, when you looked at the Bikinians, you know, it, it, there was a, a terrible obesity problem because of this, this uh, high starch, high sugar food that they were given by the government. Um, but they looked pretty prosperous. I mean, they had cars on this little island, their clothes, you know, the kids were laughing and they were happy. And so I was like, you know, going around like, okay, these don't look like people that are suffering. Of course, they're suffering internally. But how do I represent that visually? And you can, uh, so that, that was a big process. Um, and that, you know, kind of goes into a, a longer story about that. But I, um, normally, you know, like I try to be very sensitive to whatever environment I'm in, whether I'm interviewing somebody in their home or whether I'm um, have been invited in or do, in with a tribe and, and they're opening their, their culture to me. Um, but this was a situation where I had to take the risk of the Bikinians even disliking me in order for me to emerge from there with the footage that I knew was going to get them what they, or was, <laughs> would likely get them what they wanted. Because a story that powerful could really move people, the government, to give more money, which is ultimately what happened. Um, but it was the first time that I'd ever gone, okay, I don't think these people like me because I'm pushing the envelope. And that's just, that's just not a luxury that I, that I have right now. And they were indeed glad to see me go because I asked uncomfortable questions. And I kept saying, listen, I, you know, I know it's uncomfortable, but work with me here because I'm telling you, your life looks good. And if you want money, you need to open up to this, you know, more of this internal stuff. Um, and um, which they ultimately did. And um, the film was a, was a great lesson for me because I came uh, back to the US and I was really angry with the government. You know, there had just been so many egregious abuses. So part of the challenge of making that film was for me to be able to be more, to find a way of being more even in investigating what had happened there. And actually it was after the, what they call the rough cut of the screening, which was very one-sided. You know, I mean, it was a good, strong argument. There was beautiful footage and everything, but, uh, and devastating archival footage of the testing, the explosions, et cetera but it was very one-sided and the uh, executive said, okay, well, nice start, but you need to tell the other side of the story. And I, and I said, there is no other side of the story. The other side of the story is, is greed and corruption. And, you know, so I said, no, there's another side to the story. So find it. And I managed to find an engineer who had been part of the testing program. Um, uh, who was willing to talk to me. And he carried a lot of guilt about the testing and what happened. But he was able to say, look, the Cold War was so intense and we were genuinely 
uh, frightened. We genuinely thought that if we didn't get the upper hand in this nuclear uh, genie that was out of the bottle, uh, now that you know China and Russia were, were pursuing and had the bomb and even had the hydrogen bomb, um, um, it was like an existential threat. And I was able to hear it. And he, he was really telling the truth or at least telling his truth. And, uh, and so that added a lot. And it's, and it's because when I was asking him and was asking the Bikinians questions, it wasn't just asking for information. It was asking them to express something from the level of heart, the level of soul. You know, it's like, what is the nature of, of this suffering of losing your place, losing your home, having to live in exile? Um, and, um, uh, and that's asking a lot of people. That's asking a mm -hmm. lot for somebody to, to yeah. bear, you know, to bear their heart, to bear their vulnerability like that. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. likewise, in dealing with people that a part of me could say is almost like the enemy or the adversary. It's like, no, there's a there's a perspective and a lived experience behind it. So um, I also interviewed mm -hmm. somebody else from the State Department who was one of the people making decisions about how much money they would have. And, uh, and he was a real jerk of a bureaucrat. I mean, he was like uh, reptilian. He was so reptilian that when I asked him this question about funding for the uh, cleanup of the islands, and he basically said, no, it's up to them. They can take their money and you know, the money we've already given them. And if they see fit, they can clean up their own island. And he said it was such a cold kind of he did this little sniffle at the end. He was wiggling in his chair. He was sweating. He was, you know, and afterwards I said, so-and-so, I'm not going to say his name, you know, but so-and-so, I really giving you an opportunity here, you know, to express yourself, the government's viewpoint, or, you know, deep reasoning. But, and frankly, what you just said kind of makes you sound like a total jerk. And he looked at me and he said, that's, I've already said it. So take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you, so kept you, that, you kept that in the film. I kept that in the film because, you know, I made sure I've said, look, this is not a trick question. I'm not going to like do any fancy editing to make it look like you're saying something that you didn't, you know, um, please, if you, if you want to give another answer, go ahead. And he said, nope, that's it. Mm -hmm. So it's a very striking moment in the film because that, he, he represents that whole kind of Machiavellian reptilian aspect of, of the, of government decision-making. Um, and um, shortly after the yeah. film screened, he lost his job. I heard uh, <laughs> he was no longer the yeah. spokesperson for that department. Right. Um, right. Probably no accident. So um, yeah, that's, that's a wonderful story and, and wonderful insight into all that goes into uh, making films, uh, documentary films. Um, we have, we're getting some questions from the audience and we're going to take them uh, towards the end of the interview. I wanted to ask you about another film that I saw, one of the most inspiring documentary films I've seen uh, in recent years. Uh, I'm talking about My Octopus Teacher, uh, which won the Academy Award for Best Documentary. Uh, wh what, what is your impression of that film and, and why do you think that film was so compelling and, and inspiring? Well, it's one of my very favorite films of all time of any kind of film. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> You know, I wept uh, tears of amazement and joy, you know, in, in watching that film. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason um, I actually uh, <clears throat> wrote down a bunch of things, um, it provided uh, wonder, um, a, a sense of rarity, overcoming inner and outer adversity, openness to being taught by another creature. Uh, Craig Foster, the main character, went from being, you know, burned out and very fragile to being healed as a result of, not as a result of, hmm, how to say it, he, he healed as a result of a relationship, not as a result of going out and doing something that was interesting to him. 
he healed as a result of a very real and intimate relationship with this other intelligence. And it's one of the very few films, maybe the only film that I have seen about uh, other creatures where there was that sense of deep intelligence and awareness um, on the part of another creature. And so there was this part of the, like the, the tears of joy that I was, that I was feeling was there was this sense of a erasing of the artificial um, separation between humans and other creatures. You know, we, most of us, we carry around this great burden of aloneness because we feel uh, we've been taught that we're separate from nature, which of course is ridiculous, but we've been taught that, you know, and our everyday experience uh, uh, um, can exemplify that. And, and uh, particularly the more that we engage with, uh, you know, with our phones and the devices and the way that that's reshaping our brains, um, it leads to a further and further sense of, of separation. So the film was remarkable in providing these moments where you're going, <gasps> this Craig is actually being seen. He's being, you know, played with, he's being touched. Uh, he's, he's an object of curiosity by this other creature, you know? And then the whole trajectory of the story of the, uh, of the, 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 the poignant fact that this octopus lives, this female octopus lives one year, you know, or inside of one year and she's gone. And you know, watching her, sorry, this is a spoiler for people who have watched who haven't watched it. Uh, you can hit the mute button for just a minute there. Um, you know, seeing her getting kind of taken apart, you know, uh, and and the great sense of sacrifice, it's like a salmon in a way, this great sense of sacrifice where she stops eating and she's just there nurturing the the eggs for her young and um uh and that accepts death when it comes. Um, of course, not earlier, you know, when she's, when she's running from the shark and, and actually hiding and calculating and everything. So just on so many levels, from an artistic level, it's gorgeous. The cinematography was superb. The editing, you know, they had some very, very uh, top-notch editors. Uh, so every aspect of it was really well done, but at the basis of it was a tremendous respect for uh, for the subject matter, you know, for this creature's life that they were exploring, and for the life of of Craig Foster, you know, the the uh, the main character in the film. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, in your time as a filmmaker, has there been any other filmmakers that have inspired you? Any any specific heroes or heroines that have touched you? I, I know that. You just mentioned this film, but have there been other filmmakers? Yeah, in this film, uh, My Octopus Teacher was directed by, by um, Pippa uh, Ehrlich and James Reed. And so, uh, you know, I, I bow to you uh, both. Mm -hmm. um, Alex Gibney, you know, who's a contemporary uh, documentary maker, uh, Taxi to the Dark Side, uh, Enron, the smartest guys in the room. I think he's one of the most courageous uh, film documentary filmmakers out there nowadays. He's tackling the really dark, you know, really difficult subjects. He does it with a lot of integrity. Um, uh, Going back, Barbara Koppel, you know, who was one of the early documentarians, uh, did a remarkable film called Harlan County, USA, back in 1976. Um, Werner Herzog, you know, who's become a great documentary director. And I just, he's just so himself, you know, there's this very particular eccentric way that he uh, relates with the world and has a lot of a uh, sense of wonder to his work. Um, Wim Wender, Wim Wenders, uh, who was mentioned, uh, who we talked about before before the interview here, yeah. uh, did a remarkable film called The Salt of the Earth about the photographer uh, Sebastio Saldago. Um, he also did a, um, a narrative film uh, in the 80s called uh, Wings of Desire, which is an extraordinary film. 
Um, mm -hmm. Godfrey Reggio is one of my heroes. He did a film back in 1976 called uh, Koyana Skatsi. And he pioneered, he's more of an experimental filmmaker, really. It was the only, it was the first film that he'd ever done. He'd been a monk for many years, spent, uh, you know, years and years at a time in silence and, and prayer and meditation. Uh, and um, so he, uh, the whole film pretty much is time lapse. And it was a pioneering use of time lapse that had never been done before and taken to this extraordinary artistic level. Uh, uh, the camera work was all done by a man named uh, Ron Frick. Um, and that film, uh, Life Out of Balance, is what Koina Skatsi means in Hopi. And that film was absolutely devastating for me to watch. I mean, I literally cried in my girlfriend's arms for 45 minutes after, after watching that film. Um, so, yeah. That's that's the short list. There's a bunch more. Yeah. Short yeah. So speaking about the experimentation, you know, we live in a time of great change. Uh, uh, in in a sense, a continuous digital revolutionary change, which has made it both easier and cheaper for people to make independent documentary films. So does that mean that the whole medium of film is changing, or or are there sort of classical grand themes of storytelling that are still there and, and still needs to be there in order to tell a good, compelling story? No, oh, what a great question. Thank you. Um, well, I would say both. You know, the medium is changing in certain aspects because you have, you know, like reality TV and you, it kind of depends on how you define what a documentary is. Um, and I don't know how to define it anymore. Um, uh, because it means different things to different people. So we could just say nonfiction film, you know, where you're not dealing with the script and, and, and actors. Um, so, you know, filmmaking is changing in some ways because uh, the attention span uh, tends to be shortening, et cetera. Uh, and so that gives rise to, and, and there's, a, there's a quest for, uh, you know, an immediacy and, um, you know, uh, thrills and so there there's one end of filmmaking that's of documentary making that it, or nonfiction filmmaking that's more commercial where they're like going wherever the consumer wants them to go and um and the technology is you know with drones and everything else is making fantastic imagery easier and easier but there's still this whole other world um, thank goodness, of uh, documentary filmmakers um, who are doing these um, substantial stories and are still speaking truth to power. And, uh, you know, my way of thinking is that we are, we can be the truth tellers and not just the truth tellers, but, you know, we're, our story needs to change. You know, the guiding myths and stories uh, uh, that um, propel our culture need to change in serious ways. I mean, this whole new, you know, what we call the, the, the paradigm shift, you know, it'd be nice if the paradigm shift was just happening on its own, but I think it's going to need some help. And great storytelling has always been, you know, uh, the vanguard of, of change. Um, and, um, so the, the new technology, the ability for just about anybody to tell a story, um, is it changing the medium? Well, I would say it's providing more opportunities for more different forms of expression. You know, um, three minute films, two minute films, uh, stuff that's just time lapse, you know, the drone uh, photography. I shot a film uh, about a beautiful, it was an advocacy film to save a, a beautiful place of forest and stream and waterfalls from clear cutting. And almost the entire film was shot on a drone, the first time that I've used a drone. And it was just a wonderful experience because using this floating platform. So that technology was new for me to use, but it was new for me to use, but in the classic, um, uh, in the application towards a classic story. Um, you know, what? I, I think genetically, we're, we're, something in our design um, 
to love and to need stories. And so in that sense, documentary making is, uh, is not changing that much because it still comes down to how do you tell a good story? You know, the imagery is getting easier and easier and cheaper, but still you have to know how to tell a good story. And, and that means being kind of a student of, of culture, a student of psychology, a student of, of how the human mind works. Um, mm -hmm. So. All right, wonderful. I want to take a question from Parisa, who says, uh, can you speak more about being a self-taught filmmaker and what is your advice to those new to filmmaking and not knowing where to start? Mm. Well, the um, what made all the difference for me was that um, I had, when I started out in filmmaking, you know, I, I had um, a good deal of familiarity with, uh, with still photography and kind of like fine art, black and white photography in particular. Um, and so the notion of, of you know, composition and, and everything was, uh, had been drilled into me. Um, and when I started working for the National Park Service, they just started me off doing various little projects and photography and um but i'd done just a little bit of camera work too and uh nothing professional but just in one film class and um so i had a wonderful mentor i had a wonderful uh fellow named tom Kleiman, who was an executive producer at the park service and he said um i'm gonna you're on fire and I think you have some good things to say and I'm going to give you enough rope to hang yourself with. And so he kept giving me these assignments to go out and film with a 16 millimeter camera. And then um, an opportunity came up to, um, to write a script for this film about Everglades National Park. And, and I got I won that contract and we kind of went from there. So that was film school for me was actually doing it, doing it on the job. Um, that was a lot more difficult back then because everything was so expensive. 16 millimeter film, you know, was really expensive, hundreds of dollars. And then you had to develop it and then you had to print it. And you had to have a projector and you had to have, you know, it just goes on and on. And so the great democratization of filmmaking now is, um, you know, kind of has taken care of a lot of, a lot of that that high entry level, you know, that used to be there because you basically, you had to have money um, uh, to, to buy the film. Um, and the equipment was expensive and the equipment was heavy and, <laughs> but it was good training. So nowadays it's, I mean, there's film school, there's, uh, there are, uh, but I'm in the process of creating something called the Center for Conscious Cinema. And the motivation for doing that is to, um, is to provide a way for people to learn the skills of filmmaking that they need. So the good news is it's like, you don't need a film degree. A film degree doesn't make any difference. You know, National Geographic never said, um, where'd you go to film school? They just said, let's see your work. You know, let's see, let's see what you've done. And so it's, uh, filmmaking is very democratic in that way. It doesn't matter what your background is, et cetera. It just matters, you know, can you tell a story? So, um, I mean, my one word of advice would just be start studying the medium, come up with, with a little project on your own just to start to test yourself. You wanna start, uh, you know, learning interview techniques, you know, practice on family members, create a, a family archive of, of uh, uh, you know, where you interview one of your, um, your parents or sibling or friends or, you know, whoever. Um, and then if you can find, uh, you know, a program or a school that kind of takes you step-by-step step through the process, I mean, that's, that's what I'm in the process of designing right now. And it's gonna be working on the, um, on the inner aspect, you know, the, the intellect, the, the intuition as well as the intellect. You know, it's about regarding the, because filmmaking is very challenging. It's very difficult to do well. Um, 
but it's not that difficult to learn how to do it well. Um, and it just takes some, some instruction and some, some opportunities. So that's kind of the long version of the short version of the answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you mentioned the Center for Conscious Cinema that you're in the process of starting. So maybe you can say a little bit more about that, what your plans are. Uh, are, are you going to invite uh, people to study with you? Are you going, uh, do you mentor people? Do you work on independent projects? Let's say if someone comes to you with a project, uh, do you take those kinds of jobs? Yeah, I do take um, other jobs if it's the right, you know, the right kind of uh, project. Um, one of the things that I'm doing now is that I'm uh, mentoring people in filmmaking. And so if they, uh, uh, have a project that they um, are working on, but don't just don't even know how to start or how to continue. Um, there's like where I can consult on a specific project. You know, this production company was doing a that's doing a wonderful film in the Amazon, and they um, asked me for you know to look at their trailer and and to uh, to you know give them some feedback. And so I had some observations that I made um, based on the trailer and offer some suggestions that seem to be helpful to them. Um, sometimes an organization is just starting to uh, uh, plan, they wanna do a film, but don't know how to go about it and don't even know how to um, kind of refine the sense of what their organization needs in order to, uh, to do this project. Um, and so I help them with that. Uh, with individuals, it can be people, again, who have a specific project. It can be somebody who says, I just want, I want to learn cinematography with you. And so I give them exercises. And, and then on the wonder of online, you know, we can go back and forth. I could look at what they've shot. I can comment. Uh, we can, you know, deepen the process. So that's working on an individual basis or working as a, as a consultant. Um, and then I'm also, um, you know, in the process of figuring out you know, the uh, best way to put material online to where somebody will be able to actually go in a very systematic way and to, um, you know, to learn step by step the filmmaking process. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out whether that's going to be a series of live webinars or whether it's going to be pre-recorded uh, lessons that I do. Um, I may take films that I've done in the past and show the film and then deconstruct it. And uh, to where I show, you know, why I made the different decisions that I did uh, and going, you know, kind of layer by layer. Uh, but the goal is to, um, is, is to help um, people to develop who have a real love for this kind of storytelling, are motivated by love, are motivated by a sense of service and who are willing, even in the presence of, you know, because it's easy to be angry as an activist. It's easy if you really care to feel really angry. But if you make a really angry film, it tends to be a very narrow film. It tends to be, you know, the, the so-called singing to the choir. Um, and those films are not as effective. You know, they're not invalid, but they're not as effective. Uh, it's also really easy to, uh, to make uh, propaganda rather than uh, uh, advocacy. So, you know, I talk a lot in, in, in about um, um, how to developing more of a witnessing presence and to use your intellect and to use your heart, but the witnessing presence lets you know if you're getting too far off into the emotional end of it or not. Uh, so filmmaking becomes a path of awareness. Uh, there's a way of taking the considerable challenges and difficulties and the ways that projects and people and everything can, can push your buttons and there's ways of using that as all part of, of your, whatever your spiritual path is, this path of, path of awareness, really. <clears throat> thank you so much, Kevin. It's been a pleasure having you here on oh, thank our you. program today. Uh, yeah, and I want to uh, remind the viewers and listeners that uh, you can find out more about Kevin's work at wiseoakproductions.net. And, and uh, uh, hopefully there will be updates about um, his project. Um, and also 
the film here or the interview here will be available for others to see in the next few days and, and online on our website, systemchangealliance.org. So please come back, check out our articles and our work. And again, thank you so much, Kevin Pierre, for being with us today. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity. It was good to, good to share this time with you. Yes.